Welcome to API Days Hong Kong. Welcome to our stage, Architect Stage. I'm your MC today, Victor. Um, let me introduce our first speaker today, Hugo. He has more 20 years experience in software development. Currently, he works as APIs and messaging developer advocate in Red Hat. Today, he wants to share about building data as a services in HyperCal. And, and he is joining our, our our video. Yeah, I can see Hugo now. Can you see me, Hugo? Yes, hello. Hello, Hugo. Uh, uh, can you share your screen now? Correct. OK, now you should be uh, seeing my screen. Yeah, I see a screen. Yeah, here is your time. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the uh, for this uh, opportunity to talk with you and I share a little bit more on this topic that really passionates me. That it's a data gateway, security, integration, and and so on. So uh, let's get started. Uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm uh, currently working as an API and messaging developer advocate at Red Hat. I'm um, Mexican based on uh, Massachusetts in the United States. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit late here in, in, in the US, but very happy to be with you. I'm um, uh, API is an event driven specialist, uh, very passionate about open source. I have been doing open source like since uh, early two, 2000s. And I consider myself an enthusiast for travel, history, food. So if you want to follow up the conversation offline or do you want to just uh, Take a look at where sh what we are sharing in Twitter. There's my Twitter handler, so you can take a look at that and uh, follow up the conversation there. So for today's session, uh, we will be talking in the following uh, minutes about these three main topics. Uh, the first one is going to be the inevitable transformation. So what is the architecture looking now for that? And what are the challenges that these kind of architectures are uh, putting on top of the uh, open API economy? Uh, we will be talking about the microservices data and what are the different um, uh, type of configurations and type of uh, challenges that uh, microservices uh, and, and data represent. And we will be talking about data gateways, what are the different types of data gateways, what are the expected capabilities of, of a data gateway. And we will certainly try to cover some of the use cases and, and how you can implement that with, with different pieces of, of software. So. Let's go on. And what is the big main challenge when we're talking about the transformation that most of the organizations are going through? It's basically trying to modernize this. Maybe you cannot get a clear view on, on, on the details of, of the image, but it's basically a uh, typical enterprise app architecture uh, for, for a bank, right? It's full of different systems. We are talking about that different connected applications, interfaces, one more than and one more than uh, 100 different types of data stores and databases that you need to be working with. And most of them are, are just living on their own silos, right? This type of communication that we still need to do through file systems or very um, all type of protocols to be able to communicate and work with this type of architecture. So most of the uh, organizations out there are trying to modernize this type of uh, of, uh, of composition architectures and, and solutions. But it's it's very difficult, right? It's there are different challenges to be able to modernize this. Uh, first, there's uh, no modularity, so we have this monolithic type of application or architecture where everything is running on uh, dedicated hardware or even in just one single data center, we try to keep it just running all the time. It's a very complex, it's uh, it, it, the cost to manage this kind of infrastructure is it's, it's really complicated and it's, it's scaling every day where we are um, moving to our kind of, of uh, architectures. So that's why uh, there's different steps on how to modernize that type of, uh, of architecture. So there are at least three very well identified ways to do that. The first one is the big bang, right? It's like throw everything to the trash and then start new with a, with a new approach with a different provider. And that's an option for some organizations because it represents 
a, a high risk profile. There's, it's going to be a lot of different moving pieces happening at the same time, and you need to be aware of those. And, and your plans and your organization should be ready to mitigate all those kind of uh, challenges and risks. There's other option that it's, OK, let's uh, keep it that running as it is, and then let's move everything to the cloud. But the problem with that type of approach that could be very easy to implement or very fast to start working with is that sometimes we, we end with a disparate type of architectures that cannot communicate with each other or the cost of trying to do that communication and that integration goes beyond what uh, the initial cost of the, of the project can save. And then there's a third type of approach, the one that is in the middle of this, uh, of this slide, where you can have this uh, roadmap and gradual modernization of your architecture, where you can still keep the usage of your core banking or your um, central uh, piece of, of, of the core infrastructure, and then being able to grow around that and, and start to implement services and in this path that most of the people can um, hear or have perhaps heard about that it's this path from mono to micro, where you're coming from a monolithic infrastructure or a, a legacy core base, and then you start to ground that, uh, to grow that uh, architecture, extending the services, and then uh, gradually and, and moving that uh, capability and feature from that is specific um, architecture on the core to these new services that are now distributed, that are appealing to microservices architectures, and that are able to provide you with a, a lower risk because you will be still having uh, running the uh, architecture that is able to connect to these new, these, these new systems, and at the same time being able to add uh, features and, and values um, at, at the piece that it's uh, that it's uh, more suitable for your organization. And then we do have uh, this challenge of the hybrid cloud. So one of the uh, approaches, the approach that we mentioned in, in, in the past and regarding doing this uh, gradual approach and incrementing the microservices and then extending features and the capabilities of your core system uh, suddenly uh, gives us this new challenge we need to face where, okay, some of these microservices are getting the benefits of being run on a cloud provider or on a distributed system, but we are not going to be moving our mainframe or our core banking to directly to the cloud or just relocating there or rehosting those kind of systems. It's going to be challenging. So you will still need to keep running those systems in your own data center and, and in your own uh, um, uh, uh, areas of, of expertise. And we still need to get the, all the benefits and reap all the, all, all the benefits of, of this distributed cloud-based application. So this concept of hybrid cloud, it's different from multi-cloud where you have multiple, cloud, multiple clouds working together as we have had in the past, like when since uh, SaaS applications start to, to come out. But the hybrid cloud concept is that concept of applications that are running as a single entity across different clusters, across different clouds, including our own data center, our self-managed uh, cloud on-premises on, on and uh, components of our application running on other um, parts of, of the cloud. And that's where we leverage some of these uh, things, like, for example, open APIs, right? That's uh, certainly we will be hearing in, in, in this uh, day a lot of, uh, of APIs, uh, how to deal with them. And, and this is something that it's certainly into uh, distributed applications. And in these distributed um, domains where you want certainly to exchange information with other systems. And there's also DevOps for the automation. And certainly you will be thinking about containers and container orchestration, but the uh, core is still uh, gonna be reside on, on microservices. So the, um, all these pieces will be need to play together for a, a successful approach to, to the hybrid cloud. And suddenly you will see that your microservice architecture, even though you think it's, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's growing and, and it looks super promising, sometimes it needs to face the ugly uh, truth that it's your monolithic database. 
most of the times, and, and mainly in, in, in our kind of organizations in the financial services industry, uh, we have a lot of uh, information stored in, in, in our data stores, in our databases, in our data warehouse. And those uh, traditionally have been uh, consolidated and centralized in these monolithic databases. And then when suddenly we are taking that path into the microservices journey, we, uh, we tend to forget about you know, how to deal with this, uh, this uh, big thing still living in our uh, data center and how to interact with that in a peaceful way without being you know, eaten and, and, and devoured and is, uh, spit out by, by these monolithic databases. So these are the kind of challenges that you need to start thinking about when you know, try, try in, taking this approach into a modernization of, of your uh, architecture. So let's talk about uh, how you can deal with this kind of distributed architectures. So first we have identified that we, uh, when talking about APIs have really get uh, mature enough as, uh, as my colleague from IBM, Alan was, tell, was uh, saying a couple of minutes ago, where APIs are now mainstream. We really don't need to do that uh, heavy evangelism that we had to do in the past about you know why API is important and so on, and and they have actually been able to uh, solve to solve some of the challenges that we see mainly at the networking level, where you see that you have these uh, networking challenges where you need to do discovery, load balancing, where you need to do be aware that you certainly will require network resiliency. You need to do API governance. You also need to add some monitoring and tracing to be able to, you know, uh, focus and, and check what is the health of your APIs and uh, the consumption of your APIs and so on. So at, at the same time, we have these networking challenges. We also need to deal with this monolithic approach or our monolithic databases or our um, core and legacy systems. And most of the times when you are talking about the access uh, layer, you certainly will have similar challenges if, if you can see. If you can follow me, there's this problem of the uh, uh, storage abstraction layer because you certainly don't want to deal with all the different type of implementations that your core service have now and your microservice will be implementing in the future. So having an abstraction layer is something you will certainly need to deal with. Um, the access control that um, traditional architectures and traditional software had in the past may not be the required for new distributed systems and new regulations like the one that is currently now implemented in Hong Kong where uh, the TPPs will need to certainly have access to uh, our data, but we cannot just open a user that just connects directly to my, my own my database. So we need to have this kind of control approach to just start sharing that information with other, uh, with other providers. And obviously things like uh, data replication and caching, uh, when we are running on, on, on premise, uh, having a full uh, complete call from the outside cloud into my data center, it will certainly take a, a, a hit and on the cost and the latency to access that information. So having federation, having an option to do caching, it's something of the challenges that we want to approach. And obviously there's an option to do data federation, but suddenly I, don't, I cannot wait for the ETL to run to be able to have a full view of information that is coming from different sources. Perhaps it's coming from one operational database and then I need to merge or see that information with other data that perhaps it's coming, not from a database, but perhaps from a API or a different service that is also providing me this kind of information. This is why uh, I, I coined this term that is, it's, it's very provoking because it says basically, we don't know, we don't need ESBs anymore, but we still need integration. So most of the times what I hear people saying that we are doing integration, we are doing microservices and we don't need integration anymore and we don't need an ESB because you know we can do everything with microservices. I, I see that they have not realized yet and, and they're just starting journey that even though you don't need the traditional ESB type of deployment with you, where you used to have this centralized big piece of software deploying one or two machines with HA and being in the single point of access, but you still need all the capabilities that that component used to provide you. Uh, things like, for example, enterprise integration patterns. Most of the times when you're doing 
um, API composition or where you are just calling two or three services to do things like um, content enrichment or when you are doing things as simple as a content-based routing where you are checking the content of your of, of your payload and then being able to call one or, 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 or other service, you're still doing integration. The difference is that now the uh, deployment approach has changed. And instead of having just this big piece of software, we have now distributed all these capabilities within our microservices. And it's important to uh, acknowledge and be aware that this, um, these requirements and these patterns need still to be implemented. The only change that change the only uh, thing that changed is how we do implement them. And that's where, for example, we had the uh, rise of of API gateways. So you will certainly have heard about uh, API gateways. You will be certainly will be hearing about API gateways. And what did API gateways did in the past? Well, they act, they did this uh, this implementation of this detail in a decentralized way. Um, most of the API gateways and API management come from the, that ESB uh, tradition, but more modern API gateways, and mostly the ones that are running on things like Kubernetes and service meshes are more distributed way where they can um, act alone independently. They don't really need to have a centralized uh, point of access. They have these control planes that allow you to have distributed um, data planes where you're deploying the gateway and then doing things like, um, uh, uh, receiving the uh, different uh, requests and then apply some basic uh, authentication, uh, access control, even uh, caching or simple transformations that don't require access to the uh, to the real uh, to the domain of uh, uh, information and, and and logic. So that's why they they came uh, uh, very popular. And now we have uh, the challenge of uh, microservices data. So in these microservices data, we have the challenge of having the approach of one single database for microservices. So each microservices needs to own their own data. So they're the only ones that have control of what is the uh, the actual source of truth for, the, for that information, for, the, for, for that data. And each one of those microservices, if we need to share information with, with our services, they have their own version of that data. So we need to be able to share the information across different microservices. And the idea is to actually be able to abstract the uh, the data store layer because most of the of, of the times when you can see you have seen that with uh, the microservices implementations, each team is able to then select what technology they're going to be using for the implementation of your microservices. Some teams will be choosing Go or will be choosing Node.js as a way to. Uh, deploy and, and develop their, their their systems. And it happens the exact same thing with the databases persistence, with implementation details. Uh, some teams will be very comfortable using um, documental uh, data store like uh, MongoDB, or some other teams will continue using relational databases like Postgres or MySQL. Other teams will be uh, having an API uh, complete approach and then all the, all the uh, storage is gonna be through uh, APIs. So there's this uh, uh, different type of uh, implementation that you, as, as a way to access that information, don't don't really want to go uh, under details on you know, how this um, this uh, data store is implemented from your applications. So there's where we can have gateways that can extract most of the content and the benefits that we have seen in the API gateways, and then translate all those uh, requirements of those capabilities into what we call now the data gateways. So for example, when we have an API gateway that is doing this implementation uh, abstraction, this uh, contract first approach for development, doing um, load balancing, applying uh, simple uh, role-based text for crop encryption, we can translate some of those features into what we call the get data gateway. In this case, the data gateway allows us to have this abstraction of the uh, data source so we just see a simple traditional uh, virtual database and the implementation details are hidden from, from us. We can do also data federation. We can just present a one single unified logical view, even though the implementation details are residing in different stores. We can do some model shaping. We can do some caching and query optimization. When retrieving the information, we can do have materialized views that don't affect the 
uh, actual implementation store. And we can also use them as a data firewall where we can apply, as we do in the API Gateway, where we can apply um, our uh, business uh, domain and specifications for rate limits or for access or for mapping on the, on the method. We can do the exact same thing in the Gateway level where we can be able to um, apply some control access in, at the row level or even at the column level. We can do things like, for example, masking uh, credit card numbers. Perhaps my implementation detail has the complete data uh, because it's it's residing in a, in a store that is fully PCA compliant. And uh, we need to expose or share that information with another system that it's not going to receive that full information and it's going to be masked to be able to be shared. But we don't want to do that in the implementation detail because that database requires a specific type of access. We can have this virtualized view at the data gateway level where we can apply all these uh, type of controls and, 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 and masking and, and processing without having to go all the way to the uh, implementation details. So basically a data gateway is like an API gateway, but it understands all the business related with the data layer uh, besides what the API gateway does at the networking level. And for this, this is like uh, an example view of, of how data gateway we should, uh, should be uh, implemented and should be working, right? We have different uh, stores, uh, relational stores, uh, API-based stores, non-relational data stores. The data gateway is the point of access for all our applications and it exposes a protocol that it's uh, that allows us to consume data easily, like for example, ODBC for BI type of users, uh, JDBC for uh, applications and, and data scientists, and API REST or OData for traditional applications that are uh, currently using those kind of protocols. So all these kind of applications access these standard protocols and then are able to access a single type of API with implementation based on on a, a, a very common and, and known language like SQL, and then being able to query that information in a relational way. So we are looking for some capabilities in our data gateway. We want that to be able to do the abstraction and decoupling that hides our implementation and abstract the physical source. So we can have just this virtual layer. It allows us to have some security and access control where we can implement things like are not commonly available in databases, like for example, I want to use single sign-on and being able to use tokens to access my data. At the data gateway level, we should be able to do those kind of things. Allows us to do some scaling through caching, materialized views, some federation, and of course, the contract-based type of approach for this kind of, uh, of implementations into data gateway layer is through um, standard things like, like SQL. Now, there are different types of data gateways in the market, right? There are uh, a wide range of options because data, it's difficult, right? And it's one of the most difficult things to do when doing microservices. So we have the classic type of data virtualization approach where you can find tools like, for example, Informatica that are coming from the ESV world where they are implementing this, um, this approach with a, a huge uh, footprint and, and a decentralized uh, um, structure. Then you can have uh, databases with the federation that comes out of the box. So there are different solutions that are implemented at the database level where you can get all those kind of, um, of uh, sections. You can do GraphQL uh, bridges, cloud hosted applications, secure tunnels, data source API gateways. Um, and this is, for example, where a virtual application network is important. The virtual application network works at the layer seven where you can have different process and, and applications communicating without having to rely too much on the network topology. So for that, um, scoper.io is a project that implements the, the uh, virtual application network, map services running on, on Kubernetes clusters uh, through these proxies and then being able to access uh, through a secure tunnel and being able to access your applications in the data center as, um, as well as uh, access from, from the cloud. So you can have, um, sorry, you can have uh, secure data gateways with governance, where you have your monolithic application, with your monolithic database, and then microservices accessing the virtual uh, layer through the data gateway, and then the data gateway just forwarding information you require for your relational database, where you can have then um, 
uh, uh, data migration or monitor to micro type of implementations. You can do federation and abstraction where you can have these multiple uh, data sources being able to um, be implemented and show just a unified view of those different sources without needing to copy all that information into your uh, database. And finally, things like uh, the VM open banking approach where you can see all these kind of pieces working together with data gateways being a single point of access to then having your microservices architecture, your uh, wrap legacy, or even your proxy legacy available. So this is the final takeaway. I really want you to take this is that data has gravity. It requires granular access control to have really control of your data it, it, because it is difficult to move. You, you cannot change the location of your data from cloud to premise from one to place to another. And certainly, as we mentioned, the hybrid cloud approach, it's required. So it becoming a necessity to be able to have this kind of approach for accessing data that it's hybrid and allows you multiple cloud providers. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the time that uh, I was able to spend with you. And here's my uh, Twitter and my information if you want to follow up, ask so many questions. So thank you very much, Victor. So I don't know if there's any questions or? Okay. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you. This is a very informative and I think it's very useful if someone uh, used it in their next data project. Um, um, I have one question to want to ask about. I know that uh, there is a API gateways and you, you, you talk about the data gateways. Some of the function are duplicate. I want to ask about how to maximum the benefit in the both side if we apply into our project. Well, uh, you can get the uh, different type of benefits depending on on the different use cases. Uh, if you recall from the uh, from the previous slides, if you are able to um, extend the life uh, of your data implementation, you don't need to, for example, have to duplicate data or move data into another persistence or another database just to be able to, you know, um, mask the information or just transfer the information and then have to wait for this information to be copied to other. So you can get benefits from accessing in real time your applications to be able to access better, uh, to get better control of the access that you have and also be able to get the benefits of doing tracing and monitoring of how your application is being consumed without having to push all those type of configurations all top of access into the actual implementation of your of your database so you get some of those uh, benefits like you do currently with an api gateway okay. but at the data level okay i understand that if anyone have a question uh other than this section, you can uh, find a direct message to uh, Hugo. He's willing to, uh, to answer your question. Thank you to Hugo again. Thank you.